Hello, here we are today with another interesting adoptee coming to us from British Columbia. Welcome, Elle Clausen. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Yeah. Nice Welcome. to have you. Mm -hmm. From a beautiful ski town we hear, which is pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, it is pretty cool. I'm it's true. Google yeah. later to check it yes. out. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you can come visit. You can come skiing. Yeah, that oh, sounds wonderful. Nice. Yes. All right. So tell us, you know, your story from the inception, how you want to tell it and why. Okay. You're mm -hmm. Well, um, I've been on a couple of other podcasts and so, you know, there's the, the longer version there, but uh, yeah, born in 1970, adopted into a family that already had uh, two daughters. They're quite a bit older than I am. Were they biological uh, daughters or were they two adopted? So the, the first was biological and then there was infertility after that. And so then the second was adopted. And uh, then there was a long space of time because of some issues. And then they decided to adopt again. And I must admit, I always wondered about that. Like, why would you need to wait that long? So no, or why would you need another child to adopt? Right. Like what, what's going on here? Right. Mm -hmm. And, um, but you don't ask that when you're a kid, this is just where you are. I spent a lot of time in my head. I don't mm -hmm. know about, well, I do I know a bit about you guys because I've been listening to the podcast, right? But <laughs> when you spend that time in your head, um, that is just, that was a safe place. Yes, you know? I, yes. I absolutely 100% spent yeah. a lot of time in my head and with yeah. the, listening to music. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Totally. And like from very little playing dress up or just mm -hmm. making up stories about yeah. whatever, you know, just always sort of in this imaginary world. Um, so I, I am terrible at math, but my oldest sister graduated from grade 12 when I was five. So this is the spread. Mm. So yeah, really, they were gone. Years I didn't, about, yeah. yeah. And then the next one is about 10 years. And so there was not. Um, there, were, there wasn't a close sistership, sisterhood. Whatever, like separate childhoods, know? really. Yeah. It is. It's almost like yeah. growing up as an only child in a way, especially because we moved then, uh, me and my adopting parents moved for their work. My dad was a pastor and the other two were in university or just finished. So they stayed behind, like, you know, so and by was the time this... I was 11, I was by myself. Where, where were you? So I was born in a little city called Saskatoon in the province of Saskatchewan. Mm -hmm. And then when I was 11, we moved to an area in British Columbia called the Lower Mainland, which is near Vancouver. It's like an, the little city we were in is about an hour out of Vancouver. And uh, that's where then he was a part of a, a church there. And a lot of what I would say my experience was had to do with um i didn't know if it was religion or adoption half the time mm, what i was struggling with right mm. and because it was very evangelical what, what was, was his religion what was born the religion? again it was born like again. born again oh. evangelical thing because right? i was lutheran and that was bad but this um... <laughs> <laughs> whole night like, i do i understand that like yeah indoctrination is so strong in certain religions very, very. And it's almost, I know this might get some people's backs up, but uh, for me, looking back and even just looking at it now, it's kind of culty, you mm -hmm. know, yeah. um, the control, the high control, the uh, it's based on fear, really, you know, um, of going to hell, you know, when you're a kid and right. you ask Jesus into your heart so that you, you don't go to hell basically it's fire insurance yeah. um fire and insurance. so but <laughs> <laughs> which you can no I've longer get that. in california by the way but anyway. that's right i've never fire heard insurance. insurance i heard somebody the other day or a while ago i'm so old now everything's the other day and then i'll realize it was a year ago um where somebody said when you have to ask jesus into your heart by this time you know this age of knowledge where you can be aware of your separation from God because of your sinful nature, blah, blah, blah. Um, and they called it when you become eligible. <laughs> 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 and 
I, I burst out laughing. I was like, that's so funny. But I didn't know half the time, even as I grew older, what was what, like what was evangelical baggage? What was adoption? And it's just so inextricably linked in a rat's nest, right? And um, so then it was, it was tense. I was not a pleasant child necessarily. I was not a pleasant teenager. So I I, a quick, to quick a lot in. of the Smiths. <laughs> If yeah. your if your parents if your siblings were so much older were your parents a lot older? Yeah, yeah I was wondering that too. About yeah, the age. yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, my adopting dad right now is uh, uh, oh, here's me in math again, ninety three. Oh, okay, yeah, and she's in her late eighties. So, um, yeah, quite a bit older. And uh, they were both from larger families. And so like aunts and uncles, especially on my adopting dad's side was, they were old, like, you know, aunts and uncles would come to visit. My friends would be like, oh, are your grandparents here to visit? <laughs> like, no, that's <laughs> Uncle John. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you, uh, did they, t what did they tell you about being adopted? Oh, well, that I was God's gift that I was uh, specially chosen by God for them, which mm -hmm. always sat That's, a little uh, funny because I knew from a very young age that single women don't get to parent their children unless they're widows, <laughs> right? Or maybe if she's divorced, right? But back then divorce was a no-no in the church. Um, and so there was just this vague notion that single women don't get to parent, right? And so in order to redeem the situation, she would need to make the quote, right choice and have a nice two parent heterosexual family in the church raise. You yeah, know, like you knew this. Or whatever. I knew it, I knew it. And um, so I was never angry at my first mom because I just knew it, like that she would have had no choice. I didn't know what her background was or anything, but just the, the vague sense of this isn't allowed, right? Um, and so things were difficult and things were really tense. And only as an adult did I really put it together that my adopting mother is not, mm, she's not mentally healthy or emotionally healthy. She mm -hmm. has stuff in her own background that she grew up with. Nothing was like terrible necessarily, but you know, there's, we all have things, yeah. you know, um, and trauma is clearly not exclusive to adopted people or whatever, you know? So there were some things that she grew up with and she grew up with a lot of religious fear. Oh. And um, not from her parents, I don't think. I think she sort of took that on. Uh, and then there was infertility that was never worked through. And yeah. so, again, you know, the job is for me as the baby to fill this, this role and have this close relationship with her. But it's very, it was controlling and it was not nice a lot of the time but you know on paper on the surface it looked okay but she would say things to me that I would look back and think well, you said that out loud like <laughs> you know well it um, shapes you as a child it shapes you to hear sure. the, like a little cutting thing or a whatever yeah. it is that she said that's yeah. a shaping mm -hmm. yeah and uh we would spend time with family or whatever and things would be said about how I look different or whatever and I in my head be thinking yeah no shit Sherlock I'm, I'm adopted you know like I don't look like you I can't look like you I can't be like you she loves outgoing people who are charming and um sort of appealing the word she uses all the time is winsome and I was never winsome. Winsome. So, That's winsome. Yeah. Oh. It means they're, you know, charming and lovely and friendly. And, and I was quiet and, uh, 
probably more on the sullen nature naturally, yeah. <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I can relate a little bit to this because yeah. I always felt I was supposed to be a certain person and I was always, mm -hmm. you know, in cowboy boots and acting out mm -hmm. and saying the wrong thing and talk. You oh. know, there was a lot of not being the mold I was supposed to be. <laughs> yeah, always saying the wrong thing. I think I still do that. It just blurts, you know, it just comes out. And then I think, oh, don't do that. Um, you can get a that, podcast and do it all the time, like Sarah and I. That's right. Well, I, I mean, now I'm helping Heidi host hers sometimes. So I, I do do it all the time. And then we Good. talk to the, the, uh, the person who does the editing. I'm like, could we just. Like, could yes. We just yes. I have a often have things. That yes. I, edit out. I have a, I have a question for you about yeah. your adoptive mother yeah. now. So. Mm -hmm. Did she, did she work through her stuff? No, um, no, no. So there's, a, there's a lot of spiritual bypassing, right? Well, just let the Lord look after it or, you know, like harmony with the Lord, blah, 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 but nothing ever changes. Nothing has ever changed. So we are actually estranged and have been mm -hmm. for, uh, three and a half years, something like mm -hmm. that. And, um, so before that, um, I got married really young because also in Christian circles, you don't just move in together, but you know, and, and then, so we had kids a little younger and, um, she would really try to step in, you mm -hmm. know, and almost have ownership of them as, as well. It was, it's just, it's not really healthy. And, um, it's interesting as, you use the word ownership. Yeah. Just well, there's a proprietary nature, right, of this sort of thing, and to own it and own the Nate, what am I trying to say, own the narrative, you know, mm -hmm. and to have it go how she wants, how she pictured her family, how she, you know, there's not a lot of releasing um, people to do what they need to do. It's, you need to toe the line, right? Otherwise, she's going to cry or whatever. Uh, yeah. And... I love your eyes. That reaction. Oh yeah. <laughs> did 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 so you were a good adoptee as a no no. I mean, well, so getting married young was well. Part of see that's part of the religious guilt part, right? Right. So what's what? Because when it's so inextricably intertwined with adoption, but then all of a sudden there's the religious part where you need to do things in. I don't know, the, the way the Lord wants, or, you know, uh, following biblical principles, you know, all that sort of stuff, then, then that was the religious part, I always thought, but I think it also had to do with making her happy. Yeah. So was I good or bad? You know, I, I was both, I think, because I would try to be good. And I would try to do the right things and placate and whatever. And then it didn't work or it felt like lying or it felt just not me. Or I would get angry because I would feel, mm, I suppose, just like I couldn't really be myself. So that's when I would dig in my heels and become the unpleasant adoptee, right? But then mm -hmm. she'd cry and then my adopting dad would get stern and with me and things and and again back to the evangelical the crying thing. what a manipulation mm -hmm. it's a, oh so a, crying a, yeah it's so and manipulative it, yeah and it drives me crazy so even now like if i cry over something i hate it because i feel like people are gonna think i'm doing that right that i'm manipulating but it's just that things are so heavy you can't hold it in but you know and we shouldn't and yet when you're afraid people are going to then think, well, you're being manipulative now. Right. I have so, a, I have a mixed emotion with crying too. I have a lot of, do you? Um, yeah. I don't cry easily. And then when I cry, I feel weird about it. And mm -hmm. Oh, I, I hate it. <laughs> yeah. It's just, and I think a lot of adoptees have, it's a very, yeah, go on. Well, it does seem to be a bit of a, that, a common experience again, right? Has anybody studied it? Does anybody know the numbers? No. And yet every time you talk to somebody, they're like, I do that too yeah um but so yeah it was just this sort of awkward thing where i would go through these cycles of trying to be the good daughter trying to be supportive trying to reach out you know all this sort of stuff until i just couldn't 
anymore. And my health was getting really bad. And mm -hmm. again, I didn't realize it was attached to adoption. Couldn't have known. <clears throat> um, I'm athletic, we ski, you know, as I was describing. Mm -hmm. But I had such bad back pain that I could barely take the dog for a walk. And I would need help getting my shoes off or things like this, right? And this was when, when you were like, like just old? a few years ago. Okay. It got it. It came to a head. I would say it had been getting bad. I thought maybe it was attached to the difficult pregnancies I'd had. You know, maybe something was thrown out. So I went to massage. I did the chiropractor. I did yoga. You know, everything you're supposed to do, and it just kept getting worse and worse. And then when I finally cut my adopting parents off, just saying I'm not angry. I just need space. I can't do this anymore because it's controlling, you know, ABC. Um, I sent that letter and my back pain was gone within the week and it's never been back. Interesting. It's you're holding everything. in. Yeah. And it was my psoas muscle that just mm. released. Like there are psoas is our core, right? Yeah, that's right. That's our, that's the human tenderloin, you know, yeah. and, it, and it holds all of that. And and it was gone and it's never been back. <clears throat> so, you know, how do you explain that? I have a, yes. I have a question. So did you stay, mm -hmm. you got married young Yeah. and you were still in the religious yes. sense. Yeah. Are, did you stay <clears throat> married part one and part two? Are you still engulfed in your religion? In, I'm still in, married. Yes. Mm -hmm. To the same person. So it works yeah. out. Okay. Good. Yeah. 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 And I would consider myself agnostic at best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, you had to get away from that for you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And just things started to fall apart. Like just, mm, and my, my, I have a degree it's in biblical studies. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> so there are things that I was like, this is just not holding up. This is, this is falling apart. And there's a lot of holes in this plot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of plot armor that doesn't make a lot of sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just over the years, but that was the other thing that started falling apart years ago as well. But I didn't feel safe enough to say that out loud. Also, because in evangelical circles, um, that I mean, evangelism, that's the point, right? Yeah. So if somebody starts to quote, fall away from the faith, the idea is to try to pull them back in. <clears throat> now I know for some religious traditions where shunning or excommunication is how they deal with somebody who doesn't believe anymore. That is incredibly painful. And I cannot imagine because usually in religious circles, there's, that's your family. Yeah. That's your friends. That's your social group that's how you interact with the world and to be cut off would be frightening well, mm -hmm. right so people often will think well why don't those people just leave especially women who are in high control situations you know yeah. um well it's because they've been told not to trust anyone and it's because they would have to give up everything where do you go what do you do everything it's not just like leaving a marriage you're leaving your <clears throat> world yeah, everything. So I understand that's painful. And yet, <laughs> and I would say there was a moment where I thought, would somebody just shun me? <laughs> like, would you Please just cut me, me off? Because <laughs> yeah. you can't argue with me in a way that will bring me back. There's no Bible verse or whatever that you could say to me that I didn't grow up with, that I didn't study, that I don't know intimately that will make me go oh you're right i missed that one i'll yeah. come back you're like but my dad's don't. a pastor was your, <laughs> was your husband also <laughs> evangelical yeah in fact he's ordained oh <laughs> he is a reverend but he doesn't use it he so did do it. you did you both kind of leave i would say well yeah because yeah. we haven't we haven't been in a church for for years and years and years, but I would say he's has still more of a bit of a faith than I do, but it's pretty unorthodox, you know, um, just a deep thing for him. Yeah. Yeah. So, but there was that fear of actually being honest with that as well, because, you know, yeah, you get cut off with that as well, or well, not the cut off for me. I would just get hounded. Right. 
like then you would have people coming at you all the time well but don't you think and but don't you know i'm like no i don't, <laughs> I don't. and i get it it's because they're afraid of going to hell but you and know afraid of you going to hell yeah exactly exactly mm-hmm. So, so did you, did you, did, were you told who your first mother was or did mm-hmm. they give you any information about her when you were young or did, did, not did it when I was like, young, you were God's no. chosen gift for us. That's and this, right. now we're going to church and yeah. this is your life. Yeah. Yeah. And this is my life, even though it doesn't feel like it fits. And, um, even though I get teased all the time, even though, um, all of the things that that don't make sense. When I was 19, they gave me my my non-identifying information. So, and there was more on there than most people's, frankly. Um, I'm surprised they gave it to you, honestly. Yeah, well, uh, that was a weird- Legally, right? Yeah, well, that was a weird experience as well because um, we were sitting at the breakfast table, I'm pretty sure it was breakfast. And I had a friend who had come out to live with us because she wanted to live on the coast and uh, for a bit. And so she was at the table and they pulled it out and they're like, well, you're 19 now. Or, and so, or was I 18? I don't know. One of those, you know, one of those arbitrary things where suddenly it's okay to know. And um, they read it out loud to me. Oh, that's odd. Instead of handing it to you? Yeah. Yeah. They read it out loud. Controlling. And and she, yeah, very controlling. Well, see, and that was the thing because it had to go to her narrative, right? She needs to be a part of it. She, all of this sort of stuff. And he backs her up now on one hand, they're partners. And that's very sweet that they support each other. On the other hand, aiding and abetting and somebody's ill health isn't necessarily great, you know, when it's throwing other people under the bus and the other people are children. Um, for the feelings of an adult. I have a hard right. time with that. Same. <laughs> yeah, I, do yeah, too. I, just, I struggle with that a lot. And so they read it out loud, but then he, he handed it to me and I just kept it. I didn't give it back. I just kept it. And so there were just some descriptions like her height, her, her weight, the fact that she had dark hair, brown eyes. Now I had spent my whole life feeling really shitty about myself, about my build, about my appearance. I used to cry every time I looked in the mirror because I thought I was so ugly. Mm -hmm. And I feel like this idea of keeping information away from an adopted person until some arbitrary age where they can finally know. But all of those years of struggle, when you hit Mm -hmm. puberty, when you have those questions, when you wonder who do like, are my looks even a valid thing? Like, it feels like you don't, like you're in the wrong body. Mm-hmm. I felt like I was in the wrong body. Did you feel like that? Yeah. Oh God. I don't, cool. it, I don't know if it was that, those words, but I know what you mean. It, I, mm-hmm. I just felt wrong and awkward and that everybody knew it, but nobody said it. And yeah, it, I didn't like when people looked at me too long. Like, what are they looking at? I don't. Yes. It's like, a, I still don't like that, actually. I don't either. I don't either. I go, I go under the radar as much as possible. And I know I've talked about this with Heidi before and stuff that we, we both wear black. And I think oh. Megan brought that up in her book mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. where she wears black to fly under the radar. And because <laughs> you just don't want to be noticed. And mm-hmm. yet you kind of want to be noticed for you, but you don't know what you are. and so just don't look at me, you know, um, did an interview recently with somebody who, uh, he, he shared about how, when he was dating somebody at, at, you know, I can't remember if he was in his twenties and it was his birthday and he was taken out for his birthday to one of those restaurants where then they bring out the cake and they sing and things like that. And so his, the person he was seeing at the time had done this and he, he was like, I was unreasonably angry because you're a spectacle. <laughs> right? Yeah. Like yeah. people think they're doing something special for you and like surprise parties you. or something. Yeah. Awful. No, don't, don't no, be doing yeah. that. Biggest fight I ever had with my ex-husband was over a surprise party. I was like, and I didn't really? know I'd react like that. I didn't know I would react like that. I was like, right. oh, I don't like this. Yeah. Well, that was this fellow adopted person's experience as well. He just, he was like, I was unreasonably angry. Yes. And I totally got it when he said it. I was like, oh yeah, that is a nokey dokey for me because 
that is like, that's awful. I can't, I can't deal with that, you know? So going, going back to your non-identifying information, when you had it, what did you do from there with that? Well, then I just kept it and I would read it once in a while because yeah, we got off track there. You can cut that out later. No, Um, no, that's okay. We, (laughs) where, you know, when I was a kid, I could, would have been really nice to know that she had dark hair and brown eyes and uh, because I was the only one in my family who was this dark, who was, who had eyes as that were brown, like nobody on either side of the, you know, maternal or paternal adopting family had brown eyes or, you know, they were fair and freckled and I tan, you know, it's just this kind of weird thing. So I just kept it when I was older and once in a while I would read through it. And there were a couple of times where my adopters would ask or not ask, but they, if I expressed a curiosity, they would help pay for me to get more information because back then the provinces hadn't opened the record. So you would have to pay to get your information, you know, similar to the States, I think, where you have to get permission and then somebody's the gatekeeper. Right. Right. But I never went through with it. And I think it was because I knew somewhere deep down that they would try to control it. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't do that because it's mine. It was the one thing maybe you felt like you had that was yours. Right. And that I needed to do it in my way. Mm -hmm. I'm not that gregarious person. I'm not that winsome person. I do things for myself first. And actually my baby book, one of the things, you know, that is written down is one of the first phrases that I would say is I do it myself. I do it myself. And but, you know, it didn't matter how my true nature came out. It was always being molded and squashed back into what they wanted, what she wanted, really, mm-hmm. what she what she needed. And, you know, just like we, I think, and I've heard you guys talk about this, don't have mirroring, you know, mm-hmm. and, and it's hard having people look at you because you're so different and whatever, however we internalize that and create a story about that for us. I often think about, adopting parents especially when there's been infertility she's not seeing her in me either so she needs to try to make me Mm -hmm. somewhat like her so she can see something of herself in me Mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah yeah so there's this pushing this grasping this trying to mold me I've only come to that myself recently too really yeah yeah like when you say it, it's, it's like, oh, I've thought it, but I haven't put it into words. It's interesting. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, it's been interesting because, you know, I just about stopped listening to this podcast only because I'm so, um, once you see the truth of adoption and how it is complicated, not just a Hallmark movie, right? Mm-hmm. Then you can't unsee it. Haley Radke said that a number of times. And the first time she said that, I thought, oh, that is perfect. Once you mm-hmm. see it, you can't unsee it. And mm-hmm. then you guys started going through, I think it was Betty Jean Lifton's book. Mm-hmm. And you guys started coming out of the fog in real time. Yes. And I was <laughs> listening like study, to it's it. It's like a study in it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was listening to it. I was like, oh, there it is. Now I know some people don't like that term. But for lack of a better one at the moment, when you start seeing things that you can't unsee or even yes. how you've been reacting to things your whole life and that this is directly related to relinquishment and adoption and things like that, you can't unsee it. And then you had me hooked again because uh-huh. listening to you guys do that in real time, I was like, this is brilliant. I had an adoptee write me just yesterday. I was going to share with Sarah and I haven't been able to catch up with Sarah that he listened to our podcast. And then he listened to an interview that I did with Damon recently. Mm. And he's like, it's, you should listen to both. It's so beautiful. Like, you know, just the trans and he's like, I'm going to go back and listen to you and Sarah through the whole thing. I thought, oh, that's neat. And it's what you're saying. I'm sure because we did in real time, Sarah and I are like, you know, it put us through a lot live like people read and go through it we were kind of live going through it It was a hard time for both of us it was very yeah 
and it is hard awakening isn't it? or something you yeah. were doing it in front of everybody yeah like it's I did still in it's front still, of everybody thank god <laughs> it's still hard like it, it's you know you can't put the genie back in the bottle no. yeah it's the same kind of idea and then your life changes I mean yeah. it, your it relationships does. shift yeah the way you think about them change um yeah family relationships specifically yeah. and it's hard um yeah. now, now find a place where you're you kind of you know the pendulum needs to meet in the middle somehow and it's mm -hmm. it hasn't landed yet there for me absolutely so what oh, was that either. like for you guys to realize you were going through that in real time it, it was hard we have each other i think that's a big thing is sarah and i if I were doing this podcast alone, I wouldn't do this podcast alone probably mm, because it's been yeah. really, we're a team. And so we sometimes, you know, get on the phone, like, Oh, that was, is this okay? Just, you know, I know Sarah's going to show up and be brave. So I'm going to show up and be brave too. I guess that's right. You know. Right. Mm -hmm. I just, yeah, I find it really interesting. Because and don't I watch yourself to... on YouTube. That's another <laughs> Don't See, go I back. never go back and watch. we, we don't go back and listen that often either i listen to episodes but mm -hmm. well we have to listen for editing so we, but not yeah. for the really far back i haven't in a while no i haven't gone back to mm -mm. to pre-fog uh mm -hmm. episodes I, in maybe fact, you don't when, when we recommend it you know to people i never recommend anything in that first season really um, yeah. which is kind of un unfortunately a disservice to some of the adoptees that were in that first season because it I don't yeah. think you know it was just kind of a and I don't know what I'm trying right. to say but I know what um, you're saying yeah, yeah I get it I get it I mean you started this because why not you're exploring the ideas and the concepts and and the greater conversation that is happening and then you chose a book yeah. <laughs> that would push you, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So I get it. I and I I understand not going back to then because that would be hard. One mm -hmm. day, one day when you have some distance with it, definitely. Yeah. Um, and this we can cut out. Uh, need to cut out because I'd like to have a co private conversation with you about health and relating that mm -hmm. to relationships. So sure, sure. Yeah. Um, health. So, go, so, so yeah, go we back. Come back. We went yeah. on. <laughs> so go back to, um, your non-identifying information. Finding okay. your... So you held on to it. You took so it I as held your on own. To it and I just, um, once in a while would read it because I just thought it was interesting. And, you know, there were things about how many siblings she had, what everybody was interested in. Um, there wasn't very much about my, uh, my birth father. Um, and it said she just didn't want to bother his family, you know. And so in my head, I just assumed they were both young and that likely back then, 1970, right? I mean, people will still do it now with their sons. Don't you ruin his life? How do you know it's actually his? You're like, oh my God, are we really doing this still? Yeah, um, we are. Yeah, <laughs> yes, we are indeed. So I just, um, I assumed that they were both young and she didn't want to bother his family because he, you don't do that. You take care of this on your own. And you know, that was it. And, uh, then I don't even know why exactly, but you know, I was 48, I think. And I did a 23 and me. And, um, so all these years you, I just you let just it go. Let it go. You're married, raising kids. Yeah. Yeah. It's busy. leaving your, you know, leaving religion. Yeah. It's, it's busy trying to leave that religion, trying to do it in a way where people won't harass and harangue me. You know, we moved here to the ski town. Um, I recognize now that foggy thing when you look back and realize, oh, that's why I actually did that thing. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I couldn't have known before reunion and everything that came after that, I couldn't have known why I was actually making certain choices. Mm -hmm. But I think now when I look at it, moving this far away from my adopting parents, we're like 12 hours, 10 hours away or something like that. Um, 
it was like it, the easiest way to be estranged without being estranged. Yeah. Because you can't actually spend that much time together. Mm-hmm. You know, you put the and distance in. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's right. And so, uh, that was the, the first step in that. I think now when I look at it at the time, I just thought I want to get away from the rain because Vancouver in that area is like Seattle, right? I just want to get away from the rain. And so we'll go to a place where we can ski instead. Um, and so I just sat on it and it was busy and it's a busy, noisy household. We have three kids. The oldest is now, uh, 27, but you know, he was in grade four or five when we moved here and the twins were in grade one. So it was a good time to move. So we have a son and then boy and a girl twins. And uh, it was busy and noisy and great and active. And then there was a moment where um, I remember now, because I was like, why did I do this fit test? I did it because I knew somebody else who was an adopted person who did it. I don't know why they did it. And when they got their information, it revealed that the social worker or whoever was in charge of her paperwork had just filled it with lies Mm -hmm. Um, to mislead, misguide, you know, all that sort of stuff. And so I just, that morbid curiosity of mine, that gallows humor, huh? wonder if this thing that I have looked at over the years, every once in a while for this little bit of not comfort connection, I guess, mm-hmm. to something, mm-hmm. I wonder if mine is lies. Right. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so, <laughs> so I got a 23 and me test because I was like, I wonder if mine is all lies and it wasn't lies. And I was connected to a first cousin oh. immediately which I was not expecting. I had always heard of stories where people get connected to a third cousin. And Mm -hmm. these are long, difficult, arduous sort of connections to try to make them. Because what if they, you know, the third cousin and the one connection you have and your whatever, how many times great grandfather had 15 children, like who do you, how do you narrow this down? Right. But I was connected to a first cousin and, uh, then reunion started from there and they were responsive obviously you wrote yeah. to them mm-hmm. yeah it was actually kind of a funny story I mean not well it's funny now but um because my first mom was very shaken you know I mean I outed her yeah. <laughs> right and that doesn't feel great but at the same time I feel like we're in this we're in a day and age. Can we be done with the secrets? Nobody exactly. God, I swear, nobody gives a fuck anymore. No, if you had a baby, right? Nobody cares. There's no shame. There's single parents all over the place. There's like, it's I okay. It's and I understand such a dated it. concept. I mean, yeah. Like, I know you've held it for decades. I get that. And, and letting go of those things is really hard. But there's no shame. You didn't have to be then either. That was a construct. Exactly. It's such an armor though, I'm sure to hold. It's like. Absolutely. And so I get why there's the fear. And yet I just think nobody cares anymore. And if they do, they're an asshole. Like, Mm -hmm. like, can we just say it? Right. Like, so whatever. Anyway. um, So I know that it was difficult for her, but I, I did one of those sort of gentle letters to the cousin you know where you're you know how we feel it out yeah you know I'm doing some family research and I see you came up as a first cousin I was born you know one of those yeah well she lives in Ontario and uh there's an aunt uh a maternal aunt of mine my mom's youngest sister lives in Ontario so she calls her aunt, our aunt, to say, do you know of anyone who had a baby? Like who, who could this person be? Or maybe it's a cousin from some other side, like trying to make a connection. And uh, the aunt is like, I have no idea. And she's the youngest and my mom is the oldest and they're very close. There's four kids. And so she calls, but Mm. she calls her brother to ask. So I have an uncle. And he happened to be living with my first mom at the time. Mm. 
because he was in between places. So he's uh-huh. on the phone going, I have no idea. I'll, I'll ask, you know, see if, she, you know, big sister knows anything. So, <laughs> so he goes to her and says, my daughter, you know, you know, your niece, whatever got this notice and blah, blah, blah. And she just said, that was mine. And okay. his jaw just dropped because nobody knew. Nobody, not his nobody siblings, knew. not her siblings, or not her siblings, not her parents. I have a feeling her parents had an inkling because who goes away for six months, right? Mm-hmm. It's like the girls who went away. She wasn't, right. she, yeah. she sent herself away, but she did that because that's what you do, right? Like who, who does that? But it's probably um, this unspoken, like, let's ignore it. Yes, exactly. And we'll pretend it never happened. And, but siblings didn't know. Uh, the only person who ever knew was the man she did marry. And uh, he would, she told me later that he would regularly off, you know, through the years, ask, are you sure you don't want to look for her? Mm. Are you sure? And she would be like, I can't, I'm not allowed to, you know, whatever. So anyway, that is how I found them. And I have a younger sister who we are very close. Oh, and uh, on, on my paternal side, I have met them as well. I have an older brother and we are close. So is your father, I, your biological father alive? Yeah, he is. He, I have met him. He did not deny it. He did not make it difficult. He's just sort of an interesting fella. Mm-hmm. <laughs> a little bit about himself, you know? Yeah. So he was kind that when I did meet him, I was, um, my big brother really wanted me to be able to meet him because he's older, you know? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so I was staying there and the one morning I was down in the kitchen making coffee and and birth dad comes in and hadn't expected to see me around the corner. And his reaction was like, Oh, good morning, kiddo. So, you know, (laughs) yeah, (laughs) cute, but he's interesting. So we'll just leave it at that. Whatever. And does your, did you end up having a relationship with your first mom? Yeah. Yeah. Very much. So I just call her mom. Yeah. Um, Oh, you do. You call her mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I call her mom. We, I was just there a month ago for a week. Uh, we've done that a few times. It was hard over COVID, right? Like if there's yeah. any reunion things that are ha- that happened just before and then it shut things down. And and here you are, you just found this person and it's working. You know, you're, you're finding a way uh, to have I a relationship. And then all of a sudden you can't visit each other. You know, she's also on the coast. So that's a, that's a long way. It's, it's not a tiny little trip. So that was hard, but it was good and it is good. Yeah. So, um, what, what, when did you come out of the fog? Like what triggered that? What was, Mm -hmm. I think for me that it was just before COVID, um, well, COVID is relatively new like us. Yeah, 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 totally. So there were all my life I had known, like I said, I didn't know necessarily what was religion and what was the adoption, but I did know that adoption created difficulties because I I did always know that I was very different in everything that I was good at as opposed to the family I grew up in or um, how different I looked or just personality traits. I just, I didn't fit. And I always had this idea that they liked the idea of me because they wanted a child more than they liked me. Mm. Um, yeah, and we could go down a rabbit hole <laughs> with that as well. Yeah, but, big, yeah. but, you know, so I had always known that there were issues. I, I knew about the primal wound in the 90s. I, I read it. It made sense to me, you know, although that always rubbed me the wrong way that... Uh, an adopting mom had that last say, <laughs> so, right. you know, whereas then later when I found Betty Jean Lipton's book, I was like, okay, this makes sense. Cause she's an adopted person. Right. Yeah. Um, but I hadn't realized exactly how much I did 
that was a result of hypervigilance, that was a result of uh, that separation, anxiety, or trauma, all of those different things. Because we know now, it's science, right? That it's not mother and baby, it's mother baby, it's one entity. Baby doesn't know that it's separate. And even if it's um, an, uns an actual unsafe place for that baby to grow up in that home with that mother or father or whatever, the baby doesn't know that. No. The baby doesn't know it's going to a quote better home where people want it. Like baby doesn't know that we're little animals, right? And so whether or not it's a better situation literally or just a sideways step like it usually seems to be, um, baby doesn't know there's trauma. It rewires our brains. We know this mm -hmm. now. And so I, I wouldn't have known how much of that was happening. Right. So I knew there was stuff, not as much. I did the test. I, I got in touch with family. I started to meet people. I started to listen to podcasts. Well, first Haley's adoptees on, because I was like, I don't know how to do this. I don't like, how do you yeah. navigate this? What do other people think? What do other people do? And that's how I started, you know, finding other books um, like Anne's book you don't look adopted all that sort of stuff and <laughs> like your dog <laughs> mine just came in and laid down there um and uh all of a sudden things started crashing in and I've said this before the only way I can sort of describe it is you know when you go to therapy and stuff like that it's they talk about peeling like layers off the onion or like mm -hmm. you do it little by little it just felt like my onion had been chopped wide open That's, and, yeah and that open there that, it no is peeling. yeah there's no peeling there's right. all of it at once I think I saw uh a post of Anne's you know on Instagram or whatever she'll like have those her little thoughts and yeah. a little blurb and there was one and oh, have fun for people. Yeah, who are... and yeah, sorry, and have fun. And um, she, it said something like, uh, imagine somebody gave you a key and you're in this long corridor with doors and you can pick any door to open or something like this. And so she does, but all the doors slam open at once. It was that. Yeah. Um, and I felt like I broke. Like I, you know, my husband was looking at me going, who are you? What, what is going on? It's kind of like when an alcoholic gets sober, sober. and the, the family, you know, like the, everything changes, the dynamics right. all change. It does. Right. Because when, everything... when Sarah and I went through this, my husband would look at me like, who are you? What's happened to you? Really? We Same went through thing. some tough stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And it is tough because yeah. he's thinking, is this, is it a between us thing? Yeah. Is it? Like what, what's happening? Because all of a sudden, all these things that you saw, you've been making these mutual decisions together and really working as a team, realize, mm, no, pretty much I was just doing what you wanted because yeah. I knew that made you happy. Right? Mine was because different I than that, but it was more like this awakening. And, you know, we came up to a new area and it was after COVID and then mm -hmm. Sarah and I are having this big thing together. And all of a sudden I'm like, wow, you know, your mind, you're just hours of thinking about it and new yeah. discussions all the time about it and <laughs> yeah yeah A your lot. mind just right it just yeah. blows up and yeah. and uh you know and then there are certain friends who um in, in trying to be supportive well just be yourself now and i'm thinking i don't even know who that i don't know who that is and even if i started to do that now if i could figure that out a, that'd be great. B, I feel like you wouldn't love that because you've gotten used to this. You've gotten used to me being super cash about things. You've gotten used to me being like, oh yeah, like we can change plans. You've got, you know, this sort of aspects of who you think I am. Now, if I suddenly put the kibosh on that, have a yeah. boundary mm -hmm. that's right all of a sudden that's not going to be cool and i i said this so one of my best friends is um like you guys is, is an adoptee and and he and i have talked about this where there's this sort of idea of well just be yourself now but if but but the subtext is but if 
if who you are is who I always liked, that'd be great. Yeah. Right. So, <laughs> right. So be yourself. But if that's the same thing, that'd be really nice. That'd be, you know, Sarah's right about the, I haven't, I'm not, um, in, you know, recovery or anything, but it is the, mm-hmm. I have a, fr- another friend who's doesn't drink anymore. And she said, you know, I lost so many friends because yeah. where's my fun friend that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Where's my fun friend. That would be really hard. And it is very similar. I agree. Mm-hmm. because where did you go? You were the fill in the blank. Mm-hmm. Well, I was, well, the that's the chameleon kid. aspect of, yeah. of yeah. being an adopt, yeah. adopted person, isn't it? Totally. So wow, like, there's I so just, much we could keep going on forever about this. And I, I, I we need to kind of wrap it up soon, but I, yeah. there's so much to relate to. And yeah, it's been, I, I really keep revisiting this, um, the, just the deeper thoughts of coming out of the fog and the, the relationship changes. It's yeah. that, mm-hmm. I mean, I think that is kind of an entire conversation that is such a deep one to have and to keep yeah. going. Um, because it's uncomfortable, isn't it? Even just very, us, like it is for people around us. Absolutely. Cause they're wondering, where did you go? Mm-hmm. What happened? Who, who are you? Meanwhile, we're navigating everything especially if there's reunion involved, right? So you're trying to get to know people. You're trying to manage your adopting family's feelings because I have yet to hear of one where it didn't get tense at least for a while. Not everything Mm -hmm. ends up in, um, you know, estrangement like mine needed to be, but it's often awfully tense. You know, suddenly people who are like, oh yeah, we'll support you. Mm, Not... (laughs) not really there. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so we're managing everything plus everything that's inside of us. All of these things, these questions that beg other questions. And that's why I was doing that. And that's hypervigilance. And how do you stop? Yeah. Get yeah. a moment to rest. Yeah. I don't know about you guys. I've been tired. tired. Uh, really, really tired. Very. I'm, I'm just really tired. Yeah. 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 I want to learn well, how to sleep well. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Totally. Well, thank you so much for coming on and really yeah. enjoyed this conversation. I have a, deep. a deep talk and, and there's so many, so much more we could hang on for one sec. That'd be great. Yeah, absolutely. Stop recording. I would love to. Yeah, for yeah. sure. Um, um yeah, it's been wonderful. And I hope we stay in touch with you longer. I feel like we will, you know, I think that would be great. And now that conversations. I'm, yeah, now that I'm working like with Heidi on, on hers, it'd be great. I think to have some back and forth Yeah, absolutely. Just because, you know, I would love that. some of the interviews, like you said, are the same, but your format's a little different, you know, like there's different ways of, of going about this conversation. I, I just think that's really important. I do too. too. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks so much for coming. Thank Thank you. you. It was great. Thank you. It was great. Talk to you soon.